Check out this man meat right here. Oh, no, not the oh, man meat. Ooh, welcome back to another strange and mysterious podcast. Woo! Of course, I'm one of your host, G. <laughs> what is up there, G? Hey, feeling good, feeling good, man. I'm feeling good too, man. So uh, for today's episode, um, we want to finish the, the second part of this Operation Circle because I want to get to the back part of this because it was really yeah. interesting. So let's get to it. Let's do it. Ghosty's all excited. Look at this little shit. Hey, what up, Ghosty? Say what He's up. Right. Let's do this. <laughs> all right, let's do it. Seeing parts of 308's body. I was shocked. This being, with our teammates' blood and cells, looked like a large even, but the hands and legs were similar to humans. How could they have grown this being so quick? Obviously, this is well above our intelligence. I saw all I wanted to see. I told the doctor that we would like to leave. Ibatu saw that I was upset and touched my hand. Instantly, I felt concern. We traveled outside this building, a building that I did not wish to see again. I saw the dark side of this civilization. The Ebens are not the humane civilization we thought they were. You know, really fast, uh, with that being said, I think it's interesting, right, how this group of humans tried to impart their human filter onto a different Culture. alien race with different cultures and backgrounds. And he, the person was like, oh, well, they're not the civilization that we thought. They weren't as humane, right? Right. They're not human. They're not human. Like we're they're using their human compass to, you know, have an opinion on a different civilization that not has stupid. different morals and different, you know, experiences that we would do. I, I just thought that was interesting. Well, and you know, the thing about it is, is I almost feel like it would be a pig at a farm mm -hmm. going, why aren't these farmers treating us better? Like, what the fuck? You're a pig. Right. What the fuck? We're humans. We're we're below. We're we're a notch. We're definitely a notch below where they're at, bro. Mm -hmm. So, why do you expect that they're gonna treat you by some human standards? It doesn't make exactly. any sense at all. That's exactly how I felt. All right, let's continue. Because of the misunderstanding of even time, the ten-year mission was actually thirteen years. During that time, McKeever and his team learned a lot about Eben culture. Eben life was very regimented. As children mature, they're tested for aptitude and placed in jobs to which they're most suited. All Ebens work part of the day, they rest part of the day, and even pray part of the day, though the team never could figure out what kind of religion or spiritual beliefs they had. All manufacturing took place away from the Eben homes, same with agriculture. Ebens grew all their food hydroponically. The human team had taken about two years worth of food with them but when that ran out, they tried to get accustomed to even food, which wasn't easy. Everything tasted like paper or chalk. No, it sounds like they learned how to cook for my second wife. Her cooking was terrible. How bad was it? Her cooking was so bad, we prayed after the meal. Good one. No, I tell you, her cooking was bad. How bad was it? Her cooking was so bad, the flies chipped in for a screen door. Ooh, her cooking was bad. How bad was it? Her cooking was so bad, I left dental floss in the kitchen and all the roaches hung themselves. <laughs> I got a million of them. <laughs> Evens are vegetarian, but the humans wanted meat and there were animals on the planet. As I mentioned before, the Evens allowed us to kill the beasts for meat. The meat isn't really bad. 899 says it tastes like bear, which I never ate. But Evens look at us very strange when we eat meat. They allow us to do just about anything we want, and eating meat is something we need for the protein. We use the last of our salt and pepper, which does make eating their food more of a challenge. The Evens don't have anything similar. They do have an herb, as we call it, something like oregano, which they use. It has a tart taste, but we have developed a taste for it. The Evens don't use money. All Evens are required to work their assigned job and contribute to the community. There was a council of governors that controlled every single activity and every minute detail of the Evens' lives. Food, clothing, furniture, everything is supplied. The Evens go to a central distribution center and make a request, and we're given anything that they need. You know, I notice every time we do an alien story, they turn out to be hippie communists. Well, maybe it's a better way of life. Oh, yeah. Better That's for the funny. people in charge. 
The humans noticed they were getting a heavy dose of radiation from the two suns, and the heat was unbearable. It was consistently 120 to 130 degrees. Damn! Eventually, the humans were allowed to move further north. What is the climate was much more comfortable there in the 60s and 70s, and it was actually green. This environment didn't suit the Evens, but the humans loved it. After 13 years, the mission ended and eight of the 12 team members returned. 308 died on the way, and a pilot died in a vehicle crash. Two team members decided to stay on Serpo. When the remaining team members returned to Earth, they were quarantined and debriefed for an entire year. They were given new identities and large cash bonuses. Six team members retired, and two returned to active duty. Most of the team developed illnesses due to the high dose of radiation they received on the planet and died pretty young. Colonel McKeever, the last surviving team member, retired to Florida. He passed away in 2002. But he leaves what is perhaps the most important legacy in human history. A 3,000-page report detailing every aspect of traveling to and living on an alien planet. Yet there are no monuments to him. No statues, no schools or streets bear his name. Colonel McKeever volunteered for this dangerous mission not for personal glory, but in service to all Americans and the entire human race. Maybe one day he'll be recognized as a great man. But sadly, that day is not today. What the f- The Project Serpo story has become legendary in the UFO community. It's firmly part of the lore. But is it real? To get to the truth of the Serpo story, there is a lot to unravel. And there are a couple of theories. The Project Serpo saga began in November 2005, when someone named Request Anonymous emailed Victor Martinez, who ran a UFO mailing list. Anonymous said he was a retired U.S. government employee who was involved in a special program. Over the next nine months, he detailed the story you heard today. In the description, I'll link to a PDF of all his emails. It's 130 pages and covers every possible detail you can think of. The anonymous emails caused all kinds of drama. There was infighting, accusations, threats, and even a little bit of blackmail. The fighting all came down to, was Anonymous telling the truth? And if not, who was he and why was he doing this? After some excellent sleuthing from a couple of tech-savvy mailing list members, at least five separate email accounts, including Anonymous, were traced back to one man, the infamous Richard Doty. Doty? This guy again? Yep. So what makes that interesting, Richard Doty, mm -hmm. he is actually, he worked for the government, and his main thing was to create disinformation to the UFO community. Uh, there's another documentary that I don't remember the name of, but you can watch it. It's free. And it talks about his involvement huh. uh, with a guy that was um, getting signals. He even worked with the guy. So I have huh. to uh, show you that that uh, documentary. I'll have to find it and put it in the link so people can watch. But it's real interesting that he was getting into every aspect of the UFO community and putting in different, you know, pieces of disinformation to make it spread. It's very huh. interesting. Interesting. Yeah. If you've seen our episodes about Paul Benowitz and Dulce Base, you'll be familiar with the name. Doty was an Air Force intelligence agent who specialized in spreading UFO disinformation. He specifically targeted Paul Benowitz, an Albuquerque businessman who thought he was intercepting messages from aliens. Doty also used respected UFO researchers like Bill Moore to spread disinformation throughout the entire UFO community. Five different accounts, including Doty's, were emailing from the same internet provider from the same neighborhood in New Mexico. Now, to be fair to Doty, he admits to being part of the disinformation campaign, but he also says that almost everything in the campaign was true. Roswell, abductions, underground bases, and even the Project Serpo Intergalactic Exchange Program. He said everything happened. When confronted about the IP address issue, he got very angry and said that he could spoof any IP address he wanted to. Well, if that's true, why didn't he? Because, in my opinion, before Doty was exposed, Doty didn't realize email headers contained IP addresses, nor did he know that IPs could be spoofed. Eventually, the Serpo story exposed what was called the Team of Five. Christopher Green, Harold Putoff, Richard C. Doty, Victor Martinez, and Bill Ryan. Several of them worked for the CIA and military intelligence. All of them contributed to the Serpo lore in some way. But did they create the lore? Probably not. Huh. 
Even though Richard Doty and the team of five propagated and added to the Serpo lore, a story about an alien exchange program has existed since the 1950s or 60s. In 2006, when Serpo was lighting up the UFO forums, a user named Chapman weighed in. He said he was formerly of the British Ministry of Defense and said he saw the Serpo files. Yes, the files were real, but the events described in them were not. Chapman said the original Serpo story was created by Alice Bradley Sheldon. She had a successful career as a science fiction writer under the pseudonym James Tiptree Jr. She published a lot of books over a lot of years and was inducted into the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. She also happened to work for the CIA. During World War II, she worked for military intelligence and reached the rank of major, which was very high for women at the time. Uh, it, look, it, this is kind of what blows my mind, right? Because we think of, oh, well, you know, when the government gets involved, it's only through military action. It's only through very high, you know, uh, need to know bases for specific people. And yet here comes this lady that is an awesome sci-fi writer and the government yeah. hires her yeah. to create these stories. Uh, in order to fool people, that to me is mind blowing. Yeah, right. Makes sense. Yeah, where are you going to go? Where's the government going to go? Then someone that already knows the trip, you know. And look, what other uh, people are being hired, you know, to do what they do to to either misinform or redirect people. Who else assume, is getting hired? Maybe people assume, that you work with or maybe people, you know, that are just off the street when we when we walk by them. Maybe they're the ones being hired. Right. Yeah, totally. And I, I just thought that was so interesting that they would hire a sci fi writer, which kind of yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But you would sense. never think about that. Huh? Right, correct. You wouldn't. No. Makes perfect that, that's, sense. That is impressive. Right. So. Yep, I like it. After the war, she joined. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just said I like it. It's pretty cool, huh? Yep, makes perfect sense. Joined the CIA. In the early 60s, the Soviets had successfully convinced the U.S. government that they had nuclear weapons hidden on American soil. The nukes were supposedly in abandoned mines near large American cities and could be activated by sleeper agents. This wasn't true, but it wouldn't be completely disproved until 1980. Project Serpo was a response to this piece of intelligence. The CIA wanted to scare the Russians into thinking the United States had acquired advanced technology and was becoming friendly with aliens, and the Soviets might want to think twice about detonating a nuclear weapon. At first, the Serpo story worked. The KGB was nervous. But the story became more convoluted and started to sound like a cheesy sci-fi novel. This made the KGB suspicious. Then the CIA added photographs to the story. The Russians didn't buy it. The Serpo story had been forgotten for years, but resurfaced when Richard Doty and the Air Force perpetrated a very aggressive disinformation campaign against the UFO community. The purpose of this campaign was to flood the community with more and more outlandish stories. Eventually, UFO believers didn't know what was true and what wasn't. Some UFO researchers turned on each other. It was chaos and a highly successful intelligence operation. Then, over the years, Richard Doty goes from counterintelligence agent to UFO believer to keynote speaker at UFO conventions. A part of me wants to believe him, to give Doty the benefit of the doubt. He claims to this day to have nothing to do with Serpo. But if he's telling the truth, why is he making fake internet accounts? Why is he flooding the internet with the Serpo story? When anonymous AKA Richard Doty began posting about Serpo, the story was simple, but then it got more and more elaborate. Anonymous was even answering questions from the group. What this did was flood the group with outlandish information. The members didn't know what to believe and they turned on each other. The same operation Doty ran in the 80s and the same result. There is no physical evidence to prove that Serpo actually happened, but there's also no evidence to debunk it. We don't know for sure if it was made up by the CIA. Whether you believe it's true or you believe it's fake, it doesn't really matter. All we have are theories. We do know that Zeta Reticuli is a binary star system, but it's what's called a wide binary system. The stars are a light year apart, so there's no way that photo is correct. Also, it's highly unlikely that humans could eat food on an alien planet. In such a different biome, literally everything would be toxic. But Whitley Schrieber, Bob Lazar, and a few other whistleblowers say Serpo happened. Betty and Barney Hill are maybe the most famous UFO That's abductees of all time. Yeah. They said the aliens who abducted them were from Zeta Reticuli. 
Are all these people lying? Are they just building on a story that has evolved over the past 60 years? Or is there a planet out there somewhere inhabited by an intelligent race of beings living in peace, caring for one another, thinking back fondly on the time the strange earth creatures came to visit? And if the Ebens are real, you can't help but wonder, what does that alien human hybrid look like? Uh, yeah, I want to I wanna check it out. So what did you think about this whole story that we, we've heard? I like the story. I, I am I am I a hundred percent on board? No. Because I always question stories where I feel like there's too many details. There's just so many details to this one. It gives me pause. But am I saying that it's not possible? No, I'm not saying that at all. I think it's totally possible. I think that something like this sounds within the plausibility of reason. Um, I just don't know 100%. I'm just, you know, like floating in a mm -hmm. a sea of, you know, I, I'm enjoying myself, but I don't know what's rock, what's this, what's that. It, it could yeah. be anything. Um, I think it's, I think it's definitely plausible. I just don't know because like what we were talking about, the whole idea of throwing people off with, you know, fake stories and, and disinformation and propaganda and, you know, that all makes it extremely difficult to process. Mm -hmm. um, do I think that, it's totally possible that we made some sort of exchange. Yeah, I do. Um, I just don't, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not, I can't say for sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, what I think is interesting is, you know, the masterminds uh, of the people who pull the strings, right? Yeah. They give you pieces of maybe truth, but they surround the truth with a lot of fiction and opinion. And yeah. so it's hard to digest just maybe even one piece of truth to see if, you know, the surrounding parts that attach to it are actually accurate. And that's kind of the, the evil genius, right? They, they pick pieces out and then they just flood it with, you know, uh, a touch up of paint. So you can never really uncover really what the truth is. Right. Yep. And so, um, well, and people have been doing that to the truth for eons. Definitely. You take you can take truth, and if you throw it with a bunch of disinformation and half-truth and just flat-out lies, it can dilute the power of that truth, right? And so, I mean, let's be honest. Propagandists have been doing that thing for since the beginning of time. The Egyptian pharaohs were doing that shit, right? Mm -hmm. They were taking bad truths that they didn't like. Because, you know, a lot of people consider, like, for instance, a lot of people consider the Egyptians to be, I mean, if you look at just time scale, I think they beat the Mongols and the Romans for just length of time mm -hmm. as masters in their distinct universes and parts of the of the planet. And so the pharaohs and I think the Assyrians were the first to really use propaganda to kind of just kind of color things the way that they wanted to. Yeah. But people have been going, we got a bad truth. We got our asses kicked by this empire that we shouldn't have. How are we going to – we can't keep it. We can't stop it because that's the, that's the crazy thing about truth, right? Truth – has a way of just getting out there and you know it's it's really hard to block it off. So people have been poisoning the waters of truth with false truths and with other bullshit from the beginning of time. And so it makes sense that the American government would do this whenever they thought that shit had gone I mean and, and correct me if I'm wrong but the whole Roswell thing I thought there was a lot of disinformation happening when that really hit, like back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. That could have been an American 
you know, a, 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 an American government, dark, you know, dark government fucking plan from the get was, okay, we've got a handle on this truth. But now that we're getting into the 70s and the 80s, we've got alien stories, you know, Hollywood's doing its thing, whatever. Maybe we need to poison those waters. And and all of a sudden, certain things started coming out of the Roswell stuff, right? So that's the other weird thing about it is that, you know, the the people that know, they'll release just a little bit of information, right? Just a bit. Just a little bit gets to that sooth. And then they go bulk and they stop it. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a way to kind of control the narrative as well. There's all kinds of fucked up shit. So I don't know. I I, I would like to believe that this story is true. I would. I think that's interesting. They went to an alien planet. They ate alien food. They immersed themselves in alien culture. Yeah. But I just don't know. Well, I think an important point also is, is when the guy said when they flooded the information that the UFO researchers started to go at each other's necks, it it had worked prior, which Mm -hmm. means that sociologists that work maybe for, you know, the people that pull the strings understand human uh, psychology and they know how to lead people in certain directions. Oh yeah. Totally. In certain directions. Right. Oh, totally, and if, yeah. if you have an uneducated populace, right. Or people that are fixated only on what they believe only. Right. And you know how to pull the strings in whatever direction Right. Nobody questions the way that they're supposed to. So they'll either take something too far in their beliefs and somebody else knowing that they'll fight. Well, it causes division. Right. And and again, we go back to the word evil genius. Right. Where they know how human psychology works. So they know how to use groups against each other. And if you go back to, you know, COINTELPRO, you go back into time, you know, that these government agencies knew, you know, how to destabilize groups. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, they've been doing it forever, bro. Mm-hmm. And so you put that with the UFO or whatever's going on. I just think it's yeah. so interesting, right? And most people don't even know, right, that the way they act, the way they do things are all manipulated, right, based off of, for example, social media, you yeah. know, what their experiences the are. Algorithms. The algorithms. The algorithms. You know, the algorithms, right? Um, back in the day, it was magazines, right? Now it's, yeah. you know, whatever you see on TV or the internet. Magazines, and so I just thought it was just so interesting. Shows, you know, I um, mean, Heather and I used to talk about this all the time. Unsolved mysteries. Uh-huh. My family, I don't know about your family, but my family, we could set our fucking clocks to that show. Mm-hmm. Dinner was ready. Dinner was made. We're all sitting around the living room watching Unsolved Mysteries. And that show was sort of like our our entry level into the paranormal, into the supernatural into mm-hmm. that world, right? It's good episodes, the by the way, on Netflix. Yeah, I've seen a few. They're great. Um, but let, let, so let me tell you this. I I think we I don't remember if we were talking about this before or not, or if I read this on Reddit. So I I, I I'm a, in a part of a lot of Reddit groups, and one of them, there was a theory posed that there there was, you know, and of course there's a big long thread about it, but it was basically that. You know, we talk about simulation theory a lot uh, on this show. And it was basically that, what if the whole idea of aliens coming from different planets was sort of manufactured, right? Because the truth was, the ships, their like out-of-gravity defying stuff was all based on simulative processes based on a supercomputer type of reality. Basically, reality is fake. And they are just sort of these kind of software code that is meant to come in and and handle certain situations and whatnot. And the government basically came and went, oh, shit, we can't let these people realize that we're actually living, what we're living in isn't real. Mm 
It's a simulation. So let's let's explain away these phenomena of aliens as being part of the galaxy, right? Or, or, or other or whatever. And as a way of sort of hiding the truth. Because the truth, aliens are one thing, right? But finding out that your whole reality is false is a whole other ball of wax. That could collapse yeah. society, right? So, like, I don't know, man. You know, the, there's there's elements there, too, where you're just like, I don't know what to fucking believe because mm -hmm. I'm not connected to any of that shit. I think any of that shit could be possible. Could this shit be just one big simulation game? I think so. That's mm -hmm. the part. You know, that's freakier than fucking aliens coming and having doing yeah. their way with us, right? Because that means that everything's like what you're touching isn't even real, bro. You know, that's not, you know, pop, 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 pop. Do you put humans in that reality where you can't even touch real? They're going to lose their fucking minds. Feed them aliens. Yeah, as a distraction. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. There's just so many possibilities. Um, another, um, one that people should look at is Operation uh, Blue Beam, where mm -hmm. one of the, the government's things was going to be to, you know, uh, have a fake alien invasion, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's all these things, right? And just this whole story, like watching it, I was like kind of mind blown because, you know, it kind of fed the people what they wanted to hear in the UFO community. But then going back to see where it kind of originated from, a sci-fi writer, right? But then they leave the door open and like, well, the Operation Serpo files are there, but, you know, just to kind of keep them hanging on, yeah. right? And Weird. so it's just, it, it just was an amazing story to me listening to this. And so I, I just wanted to bring it to the masses, you know? No, I, I, I dig it. I think it's rad. I mean, and, and really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Serpo's real or not. Yeah. The if Serpo's real, that's awesome. If Serpo was some government kind of short of fraud that you're you're trying to fool us with, that's pretty awesome too. It's all awesome, right? It's you know. all if 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 you're someone that's into this stuff like we are, we just mm -hmm. eat this shit up. It doesn't matter, man. We just eat this shit up. And I totally agree. And so it's like Let's go there. Uh, um, uh, do I hope that we find out the truth one day? Maybe within our lifetimes? I hope, Gabe. Am I confident that that might happen? I don't know if it I don't know if it will. I don't know if it will. I don't know if I think there's a good chance that we'll die not knowing the truth. Oh yeah. Uh, to quote uh, Winston Zedmore in Ghostbusters, uh, I've seen shit that will turn you white. <laughs> <laughs> well on that note that's been our episode we'll catch you on the flip side peace peace check out this check out this mad meat right here oh no, that's a oh, man meat